Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm really excited today. I'm looking forward to this interview. I have with me Nathan Reynolds, who I've been wanting this interview for so long, Nathan. I've been persistent. And um, he is going to share his story about really surviving and leaving his family bloodline empire behind and what that looks like. So thanks for coming on the show. I want you to just take it away and share with the the listeners um, your story. Thank you so much for having me on, Amy. Yeah. It's been a wild journey to get to a place where I'm I'm even pursuing sharing my story. There's, I think when people start get exposed to survivors' testimonies, for those of you that don't uh, know, I'm a survivor of a generational system that passes their children through radical intelligent evil. And mm -hmm. I say that specifically because it's not necessarily always the humans that are the intelligent side of the equation. They tend to be the ones that are just most subtly gui beguiled into this, that have been deceived into doing wickedness on the earth. And the type of wickedness that I was raised in was a family of hypocrisy, a family of duplicitousness, where on one side they they ran their lives in a in a religious fashion, Catholic and Christian fashion. Mm -hmm. and, and so on the surface, we seem to be raised in a normal lower middle class Christian home. But underneath the surface behind that, there was a willingness to send our, me, myself, my family members pass me into this underground world where ritualistic abuse and manipulation and destruction of children is the mm -hmm. currency to play in their sporting kingdom. And mm -hmm. so my family has this had this passionate desire to to pursue power and hold yeah. on to power even when it the cost for doing so was the lives of their children the innocence of their children and so i grew up in an area called flagstaff arizona and when i was young my family got coerced back into a world that that they had in some senses broken free from they they became authentically devoted believers and followers of the scriptures however yeah. the temptation when you get thrown into total poverty when you get lose all of your access to friends and family and relationships the temptation gets drawn in that mm -hmm. if you just give us one of your children you can have access back to the to the phone book to to the directory of the phone numbers that you can call and pick it up and and whatever you need is going to be provided for you right. so my family was willing to do that and and the way that that happened is they would they would give me over like almost like a, a legal guardianship to my grandfather who's a fourth order knights at columbus a man who has devoted himself to walking in iniquity iniquity mm -hmm. like is a word that you hear in the scriptures and you're like what the heck does that mean it, it's like sin is transgression of the of the the torah of the law but when mm -hmm. you continue to 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 break that you get into this state of transgression which is like rebellion you're just like yeah. hardening yourself off and you're you're embracing that but iniquity is fully embracing the evil and what it literally does is it physiologically changes you at the dna level it, it alters your genetics it, it changes you epigenetically that means like the changes that happen within your you mentally emotionally spiritually sexually psychologically get passed on to your children to the third and fourth generations and what what that means is that people embrace that and then they keep cultivating that in their children and my great grand my great grandfather on my dad's side and my grandfather on my mother's side are were both fully committed to that. They have embraced this, this path of darkness and they found by, by walking in this iniquity that it's like a power source that yeah. they could plug into like a battery that would fuel their empire building. And so he built an empire in a city called Lake Havasu city, Arizona, where they designed this city in the middle of the desert place where it's like literally on the boundary zones of where death Valley really begins in Arizona and California that has the Colorado river coming there. And they dammed this up and they created a party city for retirees that they could have access to children on a regular basis to facilitate child sex crimes, child exploitation rings. And uh, the individual who founded this a guy named McCulloch, he literally stated that this was so that he could do mind control experiments, MK experiments okay. there in the desert. It was a former United States military army, air, army air base. The air force didn't exist back during world war two. It was the army air force army air bases. And this was an air base that was created out there in the desert. So planes that were flying across the desert, if they got in trouble, they could stop there, but yeah. he purchased this land and he purchased the London bridge, the literal London bridge from Lake Havasu city in mm -hmm. Lake Havasu city, Arizona, had it brought over from the Thames river in London and created a sovereign city state for the city of london the city of london is not a part of england not a part of great britain just like washington dc has the district of columbia which is not part of the united states it's a right. sovereign territory of itself there's a third empire city which is the vatican which is in rome but it's not rome 
And so these are the three sovereign city states that really empires that run the world. They created a sovereign legal territory there at Lake Havasu City, Arizona, so that they could have legal, re no legal recourse whatsoever when people wanted to engage in child trafficking, pedophilia, incest, and this abasement of children. And that's why they utilize this building, the London Bridge, where they used to entomb children, sacrifice children, and put them inside the walls of the building of the facade stones to hold the bridge up. This is why they wow. sing that song. The London, London Bridge, Bridge is falling down, is falling down, falling oh down. Oh my gosh. That's why that song, has, that nursery rhyme has been programmed into generations of people. Yeah. Because that is literally all about why we have to be willing to give our children over to the system mm -hmm. and so that we can hold up the empire. If right. people are willing to sacrifice their children, they're willing to do anything for the government that they serve. It shows true slavery that you're yeah. in total bondage and you're willing to give your children over to them and so yeah. i know this is a big stretch for some people to mm -hmm. understand but it's been happening from the beginning of time that right. the, this this iniquity this this power source for the kingdom of darkness darkens and sears people's consciences off so they cannot even hear the truth or see the truth they get blinded and beguiled and they're willing to go to such an extent to to pervert their children and this is what mm -hmm. i was born into and what we'll be talking about today is literally the process of what it took to kind of snatch me out of those those fiery flames of darkness. Love it. Wow. Wow. I mean, such a story. Let me ask you a couple questions. Knights of Columbus, is that a secret society? Can you kind of explain what that is? Is that like a brotherhood or Yes. So the Knights okay. of Columbus is what the the Pope has called like his right hand. The the okay. second hand of the Pope would be the Jesuits. This would be like the black magic, the black money, people that mm -hmm. are, are willing to do all kinds of radical, intelligent, evil, open face. So and the Knights of Columbus, however, is the largest fraternal organization, brotherhood yeah. that exists in the world. And it is set up as in, in couch to some. It's a secret order as in you can't just walk in there. You cannot join right. it. You know, you can't join it. You can't go in there and film all their activities. Mm -hmm. Technically, you mm -hmm. can't go in there and participate in unless you are brought into the system. So yes, it's a closed right. society, a secret society. Okay. The oaths that they swear, that the allegiances that they swear supersede that of the governments or the, the nationalities or the clauses that they have here. So if you're a member of the United States military and you swear a secrecy clause, your oath that you swear for the Knights of Columbus supersedes that. Wow. Which is why I, the, the greatest tragedy that ever occurred in the United States is allowing people that swear these other oaths to hold any positions of power, governing, or authority. Anybody that swears these oaths, like Freemasonic, Societies mm -hmm. or people that are daughters of the Eastern Star, they swear these oaths and they are literally swearing to protect other brothers or other sisters in these organizations, even in in fact of willing to pervert the laws of justice to cover up crimes for their brothers or sisters. And so wow. this is what the Knights of Columbus operates as. They kind of couch it as an insurance group, like mm -hmm. uh, almost like a network marketing version of, of an insurance agency that we kind of protect each other and help each other out. And and so most people that are brought into the first order, the second order, that's kind of the experience that they get. But the O's they swear are seriously corrupt. And, yeah. and what happens is within the Knights of Columbus, you have a giant finders group that operates within there that looks for people that are willing to compromise because compromise is the currency of the kingdom of darkness. You yeah. get people to compromise on the little things what you can do is is wage what's called a fabian war which mm -hmm. is like people have heard this maybe this phrase fabian socialist society this mm -hmm. idea comes from one of the generals of rome that was trying to fight and contend against africans that were coming in and, and invading the roman empire and trying to control the mediterranean and they were losing these wars and so they wanted some way to fight back and this guy fabian discovered that that didn't discover he utilized the tactic of a war of attrition meaning you 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 don't ever engage in massive direct battle because you're going to lose so yeah. instead he waged he destroyed supply chains he would disrupt their little uh, communications tactics he would come in and, and destroy their army when they're in camp over here but he wouldn't ever get in that co direct conflict and he just mm -hmm. slowly picked at them you know, it's like death by a thousand cuts is a way of saying it another way that you come in and just slowly, continually harass and and wage a guerrilla war down. against mm -hmm. your enemy. That's a Fabian. These people yeah. literally like the Fabian Society over in, in London, they have for their logo is the wolf in sheep's clothing. And wow. this is like the idea that they're willing to put on a cloak of innocence, mm -hmm. but underneath the surface, they're slowly devouring the flock. And that's really what the Knights of Columbus was set up to do so that as they find people who are willing to compromise, we yeah. can recruit them and bring them into a different set of rules, a different set of order so right. that they can be the handlers over these other brothers. Whereas these ones are kind of the innocent, blinded ones that yeah. we use to enact our will. Right. Wow. And you think about it, you mentioned the finders. Is that associated with the finders cult that was exposed in government documents um, that was an underground pedophile ring? Or is that just what you you labeled it as? 
So that the Finder's Cult that was exposed mm-hmm. wasn't it, back in the 1960s, yeah. early 70s. Yeah. That that is an as a textbook example of the type of thing that I'm describing. But Got what it. I'm using the word finders to describe is people whose job it is. They'd be like your recruiters. It, yeah. If you were a corporate a corporation, you'd have your recruiters whose job it is, or headhunters, they call them in business, who go around and find people with specific talents to fill positions that are needed within the network or the family. Those are what I mean by finders club. They exist within many of these open societies or closed societies. So you got finders when you go into the United States Army, you go into the Air Force, you have mm-hmm. finders that are in positions of power and authority within there at various ranks and levels to find people that would be able to fit into this role that they could use for this. This is like how the CIA recruits spies yeah. that they're spies, and how they make people double agents. It's a way of manipulating right. people and mm-hmm. preying on their innate talents and abilities just to use them. Wow. Wow. It's so organized. And, and you know, I mean, when you think about it, it's like all these different levels of organization that they've had, had to do to recruit and all these sorts of things. It's, it's fascinating. One more question before you move on. Um, and, and maybe this is an obvious question, but maybe you can help explain a little bit to our listeners is why the children? Is it just for experimentation? Is it kind of this idea of passing the children through the fire? Like we read about in the old Testament, what is this fascination with the children, the innocence? So there's two, two main components to it. Okay. There is no one really fully matures in this life. Like let's just be mm-hmm. super transparent. Okay. Yeah. But what happens is over the course of life, we change, we change physiologically from a form of biological innocence. Mm-hmm. Like you said, we, we can be highly impressionable early on in life. It's like the clay that can be easily molded versus the clay that's been fire hardened and turned into ceramics. Yeah. And this is what adults become. If any of you have tried to come and bring this kind of information to people and they're so hard into it that they cannot even hear it, they cannot even listen to it, it's because they physiologically have lost what's called neuroplasticity. Their mm-hmm. brains and their ability to take in new information have been so conditioned in a, in a way of a pattern of thinking that they cannot bring entertain an idea at the same time, hold it in their head and then analyze the information that you're bringing to them and then make a decision on it. It's like in the scriptures, they say it a better way, which is that he who decides a matter before he hears it out is a fool. Okay. Right. He just calls you a fool. Yeah. And that's really what they've designed a society of fools, people mm-hmm. that have no capacity to think logically, to use, understand how logic, grammar, and rhetoric are utilized to wage this war against them. Instead, they just listen to people that are sophists, people that are sophisticated, people that use rhetoric to, to design arguments that leads people away from the truth, and but engineers a society that is in their image and conforms to their desires. And so children have this innate ability to be manipulated on, in, on, in an evil side of it, to be got beguiled and, mm-hmm. and tricked in very, very easily. You can trick a six and seven year old into thinking things that are happening around them have a have a more imaginary uh, theatrical experience than they really do. You can beguile mm-hmm. them much more easily. And on the physical side, or sorry, on the spiritual side of things, their innocence is a pure form of power. They're, they have a, a spiritual power that is much more pure if you mm-hmm. want to defile it. And this is what you see from the beginning. When, when Abel's blood was spilled, when the first person's blood was spilled on the earth, it cried out forever, day yeah. and night, that this blood, it says the earth opened its mouth to sw- receive his blood, and that mm-hmm. blood cried out. And every innocent blood that has ever been spilled on this earth is always crying out, demanding justice. Mm-hmm. It cries out, but requiring justice to come. Now, the kingdom of darkness has used that that as the greatest power source. Like uh, one of their, their grand magicians, uh, a guy by the name of Aliester Crowley, wrote in his version of the Bible, this beastly Bible, that yeah. the purest form of sacrifice is a, is a boy, blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy under the age of nine years old. This is the yeah. best to use and abuse in this form of, mm-hmm. of bestiality. I mean, it's truly to worship this beast and yeah. get this power source from him. And so the innocence that children have is is so critical to be guarded and protected. It's the it's the antithesis. This kingdom is the antithesis of that which the chief shepherd, Yeshua, our Messiah, he he has this guardianship, this desire to guard his flock that yeah. no one can snatch him out of his hand, that the father says he can write our names in his hand and no one can take them from him. That's and right. so he is a fierce and fiery protective 
father. That's mm-hmm. what we are supposed to be like. We're supposed to have a society of men who are men who yeah. fiercely guard and protect their children and the innocents around them so that they know that that's a house of refuge, that mm-hmm. those people look after people, that they do not use people and abuse them and just throw them away. Right. But they, we have engineered a society that takes our children at the earliest times of their life and give them away to other people to raise them, shove mm-hmm. them in daycare, shove them in kindergarten, shove them in preschool, shove them in all of these sports and, and train. You hand your children off over and over and over. You give them away. This is how you give them your power because our children are supposed to be raised up in the image of righteousness. They're supposed to be Mm -hmm. raised up to know morality, to know how to do life skills. And instead we put them in a system to intentionally dumb them down and make them good servants of this beast. Yeah. Wow. You explain it so well. And I love it because you're defining these things in a way that makes it understandable. And, you know, and, and it seems like what you're saying is, you know, there, there is a physical aspect to it, right? It's the blood is shed, the, but there's also this spiritual aspect to it. And I think that that's a real big part of your story as well that you're going to share with us is this spiritual component of what's going on here, these familiar spirits, these principalities that are working through these people. So continue on. We want to hear more of your story. So what one of those physical properties that why children are utilized so heavily is that when they go through trauma states, when they go through experiences of very high emotional emotional highs or emotional lows, they yeah. produce physiologically higher concentrations of things like norepinephrine and and different hormones that are that are produced in the body, secretions from the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, that, that get secreted into the bloodstream. And literally, this is what during these rituals or these trauma mm-hmm. states where people are abusing children or making them scared them, banging loud instruments around their ears, scaring them when they they literally IV pick them and draw the blood, the serum out of them, or they hook it into their cerebral spinal system or their kidneys or their liver. They start to extract these physiological compounds so that they can create products. They spin these out and synthesize out of them different compounds that people use to genuinely pharmaceutically hack their way to the the guard back to the Garden of Eden. They want to drink from the cup of immortality. immortality. And they mm-hmm. found by consuming human blood, which is what it really is, even if they break it down into these compounds and people don't think that's blood that they're drinking, they're using these these compounds from human beings so that they can stay awake a long time, have better memory, reverse the effects of aging. Like this is why they use human baby foreskins to create Mm -hmm. beauty projects, anti-aging creams. Like this isn't like some far out thing, y'all. It's just because we lack the ability to read and comprehend what we're reading. Like the the greatest mind control that ever got persuaded against us is to teach people how to read, but not to teach them how to understand what they're reading and Mm -hmm. use what they learn to engage others in conversations. That's yeah. by design because they've written this stuff out plainly. It's been out and and it's by by requirement of the kingdom of righteousness. They have to publish their methods. They yeah. have to expose themselves. They can't stay in the secret because nothing is hidden that won't be brought Amen. to the light. And so there in, in Lake Havasu City, Arizona, my grandfather was somebody who was a great facilitator of this. He was really good at fracturing and causing children to shatter. He liked to drown, like he would drown me in the tub and then wait until I was deceased and then bring me up and resuscitate. I mean, what happens is you dissociate, you split your mind when you when you die or when you go unconscious like that. And when you come back to life, you think this person saved your life. And so you bond to that person. You go from being terrified and scared of them to that person then becomes kind of your savior. Yeah. And so this, this side of you then bonds to them and is like, I love you. You help mm. me. You protect me. And you create this very artificial bonding to them. And then you'll do anything for that person because you want to help them. You want to please them. And so he would then take me around and and have me participate in pedophilia being being raped and sodomized by other members within the brotherhood who then he would film and document so he could blackmail those people and control them later on as they got into positions of power or as in jobs and in business deals or any other time and there was a facility that they had called Oasis down there in Lake Havasu City where they would do this at they would take boys there it was like a swimming play place and you know guys could get naked with baby boys and young men and they could all do whatever they wanted back there and they had a little area underneath there where they would literally extract this stuff out of the children and sell it like a product it's cattle product and distribute it out to Las Vegas and Orange County and now into Phoenix and it was the distribution hub for the human products of right. this empire wow that is i mean you're right it's it's almost like hurts your mind to even think that this stuff is happening but it literally is in plain sight it's just are we do we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear right like are we looking at this and critically saying hey this isn't conspiracy theory this is really happening and you're sitting here telling us that it has happened and so really what you're saying is this kind of what society has been calling this adrenochrome is that 
that similar name. Well, people, I think it's just become kind of a popularized term to describe yeah. yes, these these adrenal compounds that are being used. Like okay. this. you know, some of them are more silvery, like it looks yeah. like almost like a silvery ink that comes yeah. out and different extracts. But yes, this is I've witnessed with my eyes people that drink these compounds and they're they, it looks like they year, lose years off their life. They, the wrinkles go away. They look like the fountain wow. of youth. And really? I mean, this is why the cosmetic industry exists, you know, is to beguile people into changing yes. their physical, natural state and appearance and to try to remove the consequences of to, doing terrible things to your body and not treating yourself well, not yeah. eating the way you're supposed to, not living the way you're supposed to. Like it literally, it says in the scripture, like when, when we walk in ways that are pleasing before him, like he makes our enemies to be at peace with us. Like when we have stress and tension and anxiety and duplicitousness in our soul, it, it literally shows up in our physical body. Our body demonstrates what's going on in the inside. Our skin is the biggest organ of our body. And so when you see this toxic exposure on people's skin, it's because that's what, that is the last line of defense. It's supposed to be the first line of defense, but now their body is literally trying to get rid of it out through their very skin. And so this is like mm. trying to circumnavigate the consequences of their sin, of their curses, of their, their, they're reaping what they sowed and they're trying to then cover it up because now they have wow. the power and they have the wealth and they have the control, but then they're losing their life, which is what you get from the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. The enemy is a liar and the father of lies. And so when you embrace one, what, what he gives you as what you think is truth, and then you reap at the end of it, death, which is all you get in that kingdom. Right. Then they try to hold on to power as opposed to surrendering it, confessing their freed from that and going and living in a way of contrary to that and being set free they choose to hold on to their bondage right wow that's i always wondered why some of these kind of politicians and royals and stuff always lived for so long you know you think they're like 98 years old and they're still alive jumping out of airplanes <laughs> the heck is going on um you talked about disassociation you know and i know in your book you call it the fade right and and actually it is a a blessing in some sense, because it allows you to cope with the trauma that's going on. Um, can you share a little bit about what this fade is like when, when you disassociate? Yeah. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, dissociation yeah. is a capacity that human beings have to separate themselves from a situation that's going on. You have, you have on one side of it, normal dissociation, which almost everybody in the world will experience at some point in their life. When you're doing tasks that are so ordinary that you do them all the time, your brain kind of goes on autopilot. Like, like there's literally something called driver dissociation where people drive down the highway and you, you've driven this way back and forth to your house and back to work every time, every day for many months or years, you get to a place where you can do it on autopilot. And that yeah. autopilot system is where your body is physically doing a very complex task. Driving is super complex. Go back to the day you were first time ever sitting in a car and trying to learn how to drive. Remember mm -hmm. how much mental resources it took to try to learn how to drive and try to pay attention. But then you get to a place where you've done it so long that it's literally been physically hardwired into your body to be able mm -hmm. to do that. People will, if they've ever driven home and they suddenly remember, like wake up almost in their driveway, like, wow, I wasn't really paying attention yeah. much there. That's that's dissociation on a, at a normal scale. What happens when somebody is going through severe ongoing perpetual trauma or experiences that are so brutal, especially be before the ages of seven years old and earlier in those ages of innocence, your brain can compartmentalize, fracture itself off so that the trauma the trauma that's happening physiologically to your body that you can't fight back against or you can't run away from, you can't engage fight or flight so that mm -hmm. you instead go inside. You you yeah. shatter internally. You separate yourself internally. Like I described it as the fade. It's yeah. like almost you're losing consciousness. You're, you're, you're choosing in a sense or you're, you're not necessarily choosing. You're, you're giving up mm -hmm. mentally being present in this moment and you just let your body have to go through that. And when yeah. you do that, it creates something that neurologically they call them trauma pockets. It's like an area within the brain that holds that pain. This is why people that go into car accidents, their body physically went through the entire event. But last time, that a lot of times they'll be like, the last thing I remember was starting to hit the tree. And then I woke up in the hospital. Okay. Right. Even if they were awake and screaming in the car and crying out on the side of the road, they went through all these experiences, not that they were unconscious the entire time, but their body has locked up that trauma and set it over here until you're in a time and a place where it's safe enough then you're, you're no longer in that trauma state to then process it. And so they've taken a, that phys physiological gift from, from the father yeah. to help his children endure trauma. And right. they've, they've scientifically mastered a way of using it to create mind controlled slaves, mm -hmm. people that are willing to do things that, that do things without their conscious understanding of it. This is why hypnotists are brought in. This is why people that, that understand the power of persuasion and understand how to mm -hmm. manipulate people are brought in to shatter the mind and then control what, what comes out of it, which is like an altered personality, a personality that's yeah. not the normal 
mindset and, and way of living as the original host, as the main presenting personality. So dissociation right. becomes this weapon that's used in the kingdom of darkness to try to create undetectable mind-controlled slaves, people that are willing to traffic drugs, traffic traffic humans, slaughter. Like I got into the violent side of it. I traffic stuff around for the, my family because it's easy to hide stuff in children's backpack and nobody – police generally don't search right. a, child's, a little child's backpack when they're walking with, with whoever. And right. so I would have to carry all this stuff around with me all the time or be driving back and forth, and that's – they're the mules – yeah. And then at the same time, they're also the ones that that become sex slaves. And I got really mm -hmm. into revenge. So I wanted to murder. I wanted to kill people. I wanted yeah. to kill the bad guys. And if they could just convince me that somebody was bad, I went after them and I wanted to slaughter them all. Yeah. So that's how I got caught up in that world. But dissociation for me was really just like like I describe it. It's almost like the aperture of the the shutter of the the lens is just slowly closing around you. And you're you're just completely putting the the rest of reality away mm -hmm. and you're tucking it back into that other corner room that you've created to be like, I'm not going to look at that. I don't even yeah. want to deal with that. It's kind of yeah. like the ostrich syndrome that most people have when they get exposed to this information. Mm. They, they've seen it, they've heard it, now they're accountable. And instead of dealing with it, they, they just choose to be cowards instead and shove it over here. And it's not to say that the child's being a coward when they're running away and fading, but ultimately mm. they just don't have the power and the capacity to fight back. But once they do, now they have to deal with that crap that got put in them throughout the earlier years of their life. And it can come in and flood them over and destroy them mentally, emotionally, and spiritually and just shatter and destroy their lives at times. So it takes major mm. intentional, structured, protective measures to help somebody deal with those traumas. That's why I spent 10 years in the field of psychology trying to help myself learn how to get healed and mm -hmm. help others be able to process that information. But I ultimately found in the secular psychology world, just a world of, of serpents, man. It was just yeah. another world of of propaganda that was being sure. used to beguile people and get them into a different system. And this is why I'm so passionate about the living authentically the way that the word says, because the only thing I've found and tested throughout my life to be consistently true always was the scriptures. And I'm, I'm not talking necessarily about the translation I'm holding here. I'm talking about the authenticity of what this word contains and that, yeah. that it is a living book that has reformatted my identity mm -hmm. into the image of my creator, who I was designed to be. He yeah. has given me the hardware system and this book is the software to rewrite the, the horrible programming they put into me. Yeah. Wow. You explain it so well. You have a gift of just, just really teaching, you know, and I think so many people need to hear this because you're right. We need, we can't shut this out. This is a common thread that is throughout the world that it's going on right now. And so let me ask you this when, and I know there was, you know, under project paperclip, a lot of these Nazi scientists came over like Mangala, it was doing experiments over there and on the twins and stuff. But where did, where do these people learn this? Like, where did your grandfather learn from, from that? Or does this go way back to like antiquity, you know, like the ancient mystery religions? Like, how did they, how did they figure this out? My grandfather was in Poland during that time and took a lot of that information, a lot of that, that that the content of that, the human experimentation programs, which is really what war gives a lot of people freedom to do during prison yeah. war. And you, you get access to a lot of human experimentation. The Nazis just did not have the, the computing power to take all of the, the records and the information they had and consolidate it and collate it and codify it so that they could distribute it out and use it effectively. So mm -hmm. when, the, when the war was being lost, the scientific community was grabbing up the, the, the data physical data and they were using that as bargaining chips when they were trying to flee and get out so they would flee out through different countries some of them went over to the soviet union soviet union swallowed up huge quantities of them but yeah. there was a massive race for the information mm -hmm. and so the scientific community got a lot of pardons they got a lot of passes yeah. and the way that they did that is with their documents and so the most valuable and coveted of that research was the military records on the side of like their their rocket programs and their advanced propulsion systems and their metal materials teams, like a lot of that, the technology side of it. But then the other was the the research that they found by by doing all of these horrible atrocities to human beings in, in the concentration camps. That was where so much of this data, the physical data, got hacked into by Goyim, by normal people that weren't raised in the old religions. They hacked into the information by experimenting on humans do a lot of things like putting people in, in ice chests to see how long it would take them to get frozen and stop their hearts, okay, so that they died, and then how we could bring them back to life, right? They did things like, there's it was a lot more than just gassing people. I know that's like the, yeah. the main talked about side of it, but the majority of it was the torture and the experimentation programs, especially with things like twins. People mm -hmm. that were twins went through some of the worst things, pregnant women, people that, uh, people that had any type of major abnormalities that they were looking for that they could use to to do uh, a control group and a, a an active group to, to find right. out their research on. 
So my, that's where my grandfather really got a lot of that information. And he mixed that with a lot of the uh, old religion of the, the, the Jesuits and the Knights, what the Knights of Columbus also utilize now. But that's where the, uh, those kind of got yoked in and why you see this kind of mixing between those two groups today right. in, in, a, in a high proportion. But okay. you, if you want you want to go origin stories, you do have to study the the, the kingdom of Cain, and you have to study okay. like e I call him Enoch the Evil. Enoch was the the second born, the firstborn son of Cain, and yeah. so you'll see this this like there's this genealogy that breaks out in the scriptures from the sons of Adam, and and they literally have almost the same names. It goes to the sons mm -hmm. of Cain to the sons of Seth, and they have almost the same names. And what happens is there's there's this Enoch the Evil who literally became kind of the first grand wizard over this kingdom of darkness, and that's because once. Like I talked about that iniquity that took place in Cain. Cain was warned specifically by Yahuwah to listen. Sin is crouching at your door, Cain. He's like your countenance has fallen. Okay, that's yeah. like despair. If you ever felt devastated about something that you've done in your life and it and it fell short, and you realize like like his brother got the 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 adoration and the mm. reverence that the. the he saw his brother get praised in a way that he did not, and he looked and he he harbored envy and jealousy. Okay, that's really where this this conception begins. When you start with unforgiveness in your soul, it leads to these like seven other spirits that are worse than it that come in, ultimately leading you to murder. You start with this unforgiveness, which he had towards his brother. Yeah, he harbored this unforgiveness towards him that he got something he didn't get, and he was unforgiving of it. Okay, then he had this like jealousy and this envy, and then it's just like anger that began to build up in him. And this is when you see the word of Yah came to him and was like, "Listen, sin is crouching at your door, like." Its desire is to rule you. Right. And like there's literally this door right here I'm sitting next to. And it's like he's like trying to explain to you that there is a 10 foot lion that weighs 800 pounds that has devoured every single thing it's ever set its predatory gaze on. Yeah. And it's right there on the other side of that door. It's right there. As long as you keep that door closed, it has no power to come in. But if you open the door, if you if you open the door, it will rule you, mm. devour you. And this is what happens. Every one of us gets faced with these opportunities in our life where we have to choose, do we let the devourer in, the ravager in, right? Or do we keep the door closed and do we deny it access to our lives forever, okay? Mm. He he opened the door and he let rage and wrath come in and murder and hatred. And it just consumed him and struck his brother down. He killed him and spilled the blood. And when he did that, he willfully gave himself over to this and he suffered the curse, the consequences of it. Mm -hmm. And those consequences, those curses got passed on to his children. Right. Those he chose to, he didn't choose to walk in obedience to the curses in order to, he said, you're going to go wander about two and four in the earth. He's like, you're going to go be a wanderer in the earth. Mm -hmm. And instead he actually went and stopped and he made a city for his son, Enoch. And that was just like an act of rebellion. Like, I'm not going to go wander. I'm not going to go spread out. I'm going to gather together power and control over people so they right. do all the work and serve me. And this is where Enoch the evil started the mystery religions. We call it the old religion. Like, yeah. So anytime you're dealing with these people, like one of the better books to analyze this is the Shinar Directive. Okay. This is a great breakdown of it. Dr. Michael Lake um, from Kingdom Intelligence Briefing wrote this book, the Shinar Directive. He does a fantastic job of breaking this down from a, a much more, I don't know, systemic uh scholarly style he's a passionate <laughs> fiery man of he's a ferocious man of yeah but he's also a scholar so he's for all you people that need all your scholarly style of, of life i get it i totally understand <laughs> it i like to read their stuff i just i'm not that guy but he put that down in a much more uh consistent and logical way that would help some of you that are trying to understand where did this come from but people right. took this information this way of dialing the kingdom of darkness's phone numbers and being able to hack into the kingdom of darkness so that they could fuel up their kingdom and control people as yeah. opposed to a shepherd which doesn't control the flock a shepherd doesn't control the flock you can try to control a flock you're going to get a totally different kind of thing you mm -hmm. can't control them you can try you have an illusion of control but if ever the flock really determines up in their hearts that they're like they're going to rise up and none of that they will totally to overpower you like i've had i've had goats completely knock knock me on my rear end like goats can team up together and be stiff necked and rebellious. Mm. Like we had, I had a fence when I was a, a shepherd that was put on backwards. And so if the goats pushed on it together, they would just completely collapse the fence. Yeah. But if one or two of them pushed on it, it was never a big deal. But sometimes there was one ringleader, his name was Gandalf, and he was totally possessed by demons. I know people are like, what? Yeah, no, <sighs> animals can be possessed by demons. Look at the pigs and the gadarene. Yeah. They're, they're super demonic, y'all. I love goats. At the same time, I want to kill them all because they're ridiculously <laughs> creepy sometimes. And this goat would literally get the rest of the flock together, and he would go and attack the fence. And he would just get everyone to get and break out like that. And this is the flock can turn on a shepherd and do this mm. to you. But if you're a domineering person and want to control everyone, you need the system with which to give, keep them in line. And this is why this old religion works. This right. is why people have been consistently 
patterning themselves and their children into the system. And it's like why the, the divine right of kings to rule is because they have power through this information, this gnosis. This is yeah. like the all-seeing eye that they are they believe the dragon has given them the look into the future and has shown mm. them the way to, to follow this path and how they can control the power and the wealth. We can sit at the top of the pyramid and see all four sides of the pyramid, whereas everybody else that's down there can only see one side of it at any given time. But once you're at the top, you're like, oh, I get to see how everything works, and I am my own god. Right. Mm -hmm. This is a, the illusion of biting into the serpent's doctrine. And so right. that version that we now see today playing out comes from these mystery religions. It's always been there, but it was scattered at the Tower of Babel when he confused the languages. So, yeah. so much of what we're seeing today is trying to assimilate that information to get everybody back in one tribe and one tongue and one people and one mind so they can do what they tried to do there, which was to literally make a war with the son of Elohim. They want to wage yeah. war with him and take over his kingdom because they have it in their hearts to rebel. That yeah. is literally what like Nimrod is. He's like mm. the rebel. And they're trying yep. to raise him up again. And they say try to make these rituals, like the Scorch Trials, the Apollo Trials. Like this is what my grandfather and these these magicians were trying to make these their sons do is pass through these horrible tortures. And so that out of them could be possessed this Godhead and yeah. that they could then raise up gods in their own image. Wow. And so there's literal demonic entities involved in this being passed down. Absolutely. Yeah. This is why the sins of a father can get passed Carry down. On. They make up all this garbage. They call it epigenetics in science where they're like, yeah, alcoholism. We're looking for the gene yes. that turns this on. It's a bunch of nonsense. What they don't understand is that they've been beguiled to not even understand the basic fundamentals of how humans uh, humans are spirit, soul, and body. And if right. you don't understand the tripartite nature of man, you have no capacity to understand how these spirits are what you're dealing with. Like Absolutely. there is no such thing as epilepsy. I know that's a word we use to describe a seizure disorder, what we call it. Mm -hmm. It's very clear from the scriptures. Yeshua cast out that spirit mm -hmm. of epilepsy that through that literally that spirit wanted to throw them into fire and wanted to throw them into water, wanted to torture them, wanted to kill them, wanted to, to, to torment their parents. I mean, if you're a parent of somebody who has epilepsy, it is, it is so frustrating we lived at that farm where the, those goats were their son would get these seizures mm -hmm. and and it was uh, my uh, my daughter at the time was she was three years old and i had an eight month old and they they would see their son john mark go through these seizures mm -hmm. and their brothers and sisters they grew up in that they'd grown up grown up seeing it but to people that have not seen people go into seizures it's extremely terrifying i mean it's terrifying yeah. It's terrifying and it terrorizes mm. people. It's it interrupts everybody's day. It interrupts everything that's going on. And sometimes there will be two or three or four or eight or twenty a day. Mm -hmm. Like it's just it's crippling people. And what it causes is this just anguish of soul, this torment within. And this is what these spirits feed on. Yeah. They, their fuel is those negative emotions. It's that it's that fear. It's that anger. It's that rage. It's that doubt. It's that despair. It's that hopelessness. It's that lust. That is literally their food because they can't eat. It's like they're starving. It says they're the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. The yeah. Nephilim were the, the offspring of the fallen watchers, the sons of Elohim that mm -hmm. rebelled. If you read it in Genesis 6, they came down and taught men and women sorcery, divination. They taught them this ancient secrets of heaven yeah. and they beguiled them and they mixed their seed their physiological seed in the seed of the serpent into the bloodline of mankind and raised up this offspring called giants that, right. that the nephilim and they were the ones who their spirit and was corrupted in heavenly spirit and a earthly spirit and so they were not allowed to be judged the same way so they literally were cursed to be restless spirits on the earth mm -hmm. having hunger but unable to satisfy themselves having thirst but being unable to quench themselves so that's why they enact these lusts through human skin suits so right. that they can still interact and engage in this stuff which is why when true authority shows up and binds them mm -hmm. and casts them out there is a cessation of that it stops and deliverance yeah. is authored this is why Yeshua spoke a word and cast that out of something, out of a human being, and freed a family from torture, from yeah. anguish. This is why this this DSM five, this these all these mental disorders are being described. They're they're lies. They make this up so they can facilitate a model to mm. to govern the pharmaceutical industry, to prop up an industry of death. They utilize this Bible of their diagnostic and statistic manual to try to do this. They make up these diseases so that they can control people in a totally different way. But if you authorize truth in people, if you show them that this stuff can, they can have healing, no matter what you're physically mm. going through, there is a spiritual root to every disease that you are encountering on the earth. I, I agree with that. I really do. And I think a lot of people in America, and I know we're kind of digressing off your story, but I think this is really important that you brought this up because a lot of people in America specifically don't really understand this. They they see the extremes of what they see, you know, deliverance as, and then they 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 don't 
comprehend it, but you go to different cultures, different places around the world. This is seeped in their, in their culture. They get it that these demonic principalities, these demons, they're real. And so I love that you described all this, how it's associated with big pharma, pharmacia, all of that stuff. I mean, we, we negate the spiritual and we always just focus on the physical. And to your point, we, ha- we are made of three parts. And so we cannot negate these other parts of who we are and how God designed us. So I love what you're saying. It's so good. I mean, I could probably talk to you for hours, <laughs> just fascinating wealth of information. And so, okay, going back to, back to Lake Havasu, back to growing up, describe to me kind of that transition. You're, you're a young boy, you're going to these places, you're being, you know, ushered around and handled by your grandfather move us through the rest of that into the military aspect as well. Cause I know you, you went into the military for some time as well. Well, yes. So the yeah. military really got started there in, in Lake Havasu because the, mm-hmm. the Jesuits, like I said earlier, are the militant arm of the Pope and, and they are people that have, have guarded the secrets of, of the, the assassins that the Hashashins or the zealots, like you read about in the scripture, you talk about Judas Iscariot. There, yeah. It's Judas, the zealot. That's literally the word that you get. They were assassins. There's people that, that, that see evil, whatever form of it, they see evil and they want to stop it physically. And yeah. so they get trained up in the arts of death. Mm-hmm. And this is literally back to the ways of Cain because he's the first murderer. So when you really want to study martial arts, all, there is no martial arts that's not connected to that. There wow. really isn't. If every single one, you dig into the origins of every single martial arts combative systems that exist on the earth, I've yet to find a single one that does not have at its origins the the ways of Cain. And wow. so this, this, this kingdom takes people who have those predilections. Like I, I had an aptitudes for being able to learn and retain information and replicate it quickly. And yeah. so if they showed me, hey, this is how this is how you stab somebody in their left ventricle with this needle. And when you do that, it's going to inject something, potassium, in such a high concentration, it's going to cause a heart attack. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then this way makes it look like, oh, they just died of natural causes, right? right? Basically, they teach you how to suicide people on a regular basis in all kinds of different forms and fashions. And you go mm-hmm. to a place that has access to a lot of bodies. So this is why the universities and the education mm-hmm. systems get brought in. You get taken to the cadaver labs where you get to practice stabbing and killing people. They had it in Lake Havasu City there under Oasis. They had a lot of bodies that you could physically train on and oh learn, how to, learn how to kill somebody in under two seconds because that was wow. kind of the whole name of the game. So you just got to learn how to kill people super fast. And when you're a child, you have to learn how to do that from different methods than somebody who is a grown adult. And so they have different forms of, of combat training systems. And they use a lot of Filipino martial arts and things like Salat in order to do that. People that are smaller and shorter of stature and traditionally women who are used as bodyguards in places like harems or, or brothels. And mm-hmm. they, they, this is what uh, a lot of times a eunuch's job was in the, in a palace or in a king's guard is that he was a trained guardian for the husband's wives. And so they physically castrate that I couldn't have children and I could have access to a lot of these other kind of uh, wealthy and influential people's families and their children. And I could be around them without necessarily passing on my seat to any of them. Mm-hmm. And so I got raised up in this kind of militant vengeance cycle where I wanted to go out and hunt and and slaughter these people for them. And with with the the thought in my mind that I am I am finally getting to fight back. I'm no longer trapped in these people's brothels. I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not their sex slave anymore, that I'm finally a hero. Mm-hmm. And it, it gave me a sense of justice. It gave me a sense of of I have a purpose. And this is generally what happens after they've conditioned the child mm-hmm. through a lot of this mind control early on that they then let them express their talents, but only in an arena that they choose to. So some of them get funneled into the music industry. Some of them get funneled mm-hmm. into the finance industry, in real estate, into politics, into governments, into scientific communities. They then get facilitated into them. They take what could be child prodigies and they instead control them and warp them into an image that facilitates the family or the network's needs and desires. And so I kind of got geared up to basically be a a slave within the the military industrial complex that I could go in and infiltrate it and take the the power and the information and the classified information and feed it back to the family yeah. and compromise people within that system and control them so that they could then become parts of the brotherhood right and so I ended up like there's our there's a handle over my family's name was Richard and he he was a, a dentist and so he had access to a lot of these these body, physiological body altering drugs that he would use to do a lot of this programming with and to do a lot of this fracturing with so this is why dentist offices mm-hmm. man are just so readily used veterinarians and dentists tend to be some of the most recruited people within the network and the families because they have access to drugs and 
and a facility where they can do a lot of these practices at. Wow. And the I got eventually brought into the United States Army, but predominantly the majority of my family's workings with in the military was all through the United States Air Force. So they relocated us from the White Mountains of Arizona to a town called Colorado Springs, Colorado. And it was so that they could have access to the United States Air Force Academy. The United States mm-hmm. Air Force Academy is where they train you know, their upper cadre of officers to be part of the United States Air Force. And in within there, they have some of the highest neural reprogramming linguistics department that exists anywhere in the world. And that's where they bring in people to become a lot of these uh, agents of evil within their kingdom. And so yeah. that's where I really got hooked into the United States military was there. And at NORAD, um, which is in Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado, I had a, a lieutenant colonel that was there, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Weaver, that his job was was over Space Command kind of uh, projects there at NORAD. And between those two guys, they got me uh, high clearances within the United States Army to get enlisted and emancipated the United States government at 17 years old as a junior in high school. I got shipped off to Fort Knox, Kentucky and got brought into what I thought was finally the hero's game. I finally yeah. thought I was going to be a soldier that got ribbons for the work that I did, that I would get awards. I just wanted a lot of medals on my chest and I wanted to die basically at that point mm-hmm. in my life. I just wanted to die a hero's death because I was so miserable and mm-hmm. I was so tired of everybody being liars that I would always find the skeletons in people's closets. It's like I'm custom catered to find the filth in everybody's closet. And once I find it, I want to scream it from the rooftops. I want to make sure every person on the face of the earth knows that that person's a monster. Mm -hmm. And I am very, very passionate about what I do. And when I find that, I want to burn it to the ground. And so they're like, you betcha, come on in with us and we'll give you a license to kill and we'll give you an entire team and package behind you and you can go and hunt and kill with us. And so I got brought into these Agent Orange and these other teams that, that operate within like the special forces. But real special forces guys generally don't, look like anything part of it. They get put into basic supply chain units. They get put into mechanic shops. They get put into the units so that they can then identify other people and recruit them and bring them in. Or they can do spy, espionage, and other stuff so they have access within the supply chain of the entire United States military. That's what I got put into. And I I went on a rampage within that system thinking that I was finally the heroes, hero of heroes. You know, We yeah. worship our soldiers like they're gods in our society. And even though they're really just, they're slaves in a totally different system, fighting for what they think is freedom. Meanwhile, they're the, the literal embodiment of evil to so many millions of people, billions of people mm-hmm. all over the world turn around and look at us like we're the tyrants. And we're like, why don't you guys understand? We're here to help you. We just yeah. killed a million of your civilians. Don't you know we're here to set you free? Yeah. Like, you destroyed everything. You destroyed our water, our infrastructure, our power systems, our sewage systems. You eradicated our entire country. Like, no. You're not doing that, but we get beguiled because we believe the propaganda systems that yeah. that, stir, that stir us up to try to go be heroes. And we're like, we're fighting the bad guys. Meanwhile, we understand that we are work. We're merchants of death. One of the best books y'all can read, if any of you have the passion or the desire to be a soldier, is um, Butler, who is the highest decorated Marine in the history of the United States, a general in the, in the Marines from World War One. He literally wrote, uh, "War is a racket." It's like a 50 minute audiobook. If you want to listen to an audiobook for free on YouTube, it's called War is a Racket. And he here's a guy at the end of his life being like, you know what I did? I was literally a mercenary for hire. I worked mm-hmm. for corporations to conquer kingdoms, to destroy nations. I slaughtered for them. And they were too willing, unwilling to send their own sons or send themselves. So they send people that they beguiled into the system. And here yeah. he's reflecting on all the evil that he did mm-hmm. in the name of freedom and defending mm. the constitution and realizing that all I've done is make a banana republics in, in Central America so that the fruit companies could come in and this is why you can get a banana for $1.35. You're like, why is a banana so cheap? By yeah. design, because the United States entire military industrial complex waged wars and took over countries so that you could have your cheap bananas and they could make billions of dollars. Like, so There's a documentary series called The Banana Wars, which is excellent to help you learn about that as well. But yeah. this is the system of evil and I started seeing that with the United States military and I started seeing that I'm just another pawn in the game, that I'm so tired of not actually being a part of a system of true justice. Like mm-hmm. I really wanted to be around the righteous and I right. and I kept looking for them in the wrong places. I kept looking for them in the wrong seats of, of power. I kept looking that sooner or later, I'm going to find the people that actually do right. They mm-hmm. don't do wickedness. Like they, they actually do right. Like they would send us in to infiltrate a pedophile ring. Okay. For example, like in Alexandria, Virginia, there was a huge pedophile ring that we were investigating and we got, we got assigned to this guy named, they called him blue agent blue. And he was a guy who was a very well-known human trafficker who liked to skin his victims alive and put on their, their skin and then, and then sexually abuse them. This was like his thing that he was into. And so they had a, a big house there, a big estate there in Alexandria, Virginia, where that's what they did. And, and he was known for doing this and he had access to a lot of children and a lot of wealth. And so he was continually doing this kind of behavior. And I got sent in to capture him and bring him out. Okay. 
as I went into that place and and saw these activities, there was a there was a house full of people doing the same exact thing. But I got sent in after one guy. And the only reason I went in there to get that guy is because somebody else had paid a huge amount of money so that we could knock him off the power plate. So like we capture him, take him out, torture him and extract oh, the information no. for him and kill him. And you know what? They put their next agent into his place. Oh my so that gosh. they now have their plant within this within the the ring. And they're like, yeah, this is so that we can right. take the next ring. And oh it's just God. a constant dog eat dog, wolf devouring wolf, serpents eating serpents. And I realized <sighs> at the end of this, this is never gonna stop as long as I keep trying to work within this system because yeah. this is insanity. I'm doing mm-hmm. the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Right. I am disillusioned, I am utterly despairing. And so I rebelled against a direct order. I it was like I turned and bit the hand of the 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 guy who'd been holding my leash for way too long. I devoured my handlers mm. and it they shut me down so fast. They eradicated, they blotted me out of the United States military in a matter of months. I was completely out of my mind, cut off from everything. They literally came back and I got honorably medically discharged from the United States military. But they came back and took my signing bonus. This is one of those things that you don't hear on the TV that you will not hear in your next James Cameron and the right. next big mega movie. They're like, oh, yeah, we got all the United States military is doing these movies with us. And they're so helping us as long as you sign an agreement in Hollywood that you don't ever talk about these things I'm about to say, which shows United States soldiers killing United States soldiers, which happens all the time. I went and killed soldiers in the United States military. I killed people in the United States citizens here in the wow. United States on a regular basis. You can't talk about that stuff in your movies. They can't right. show you that in your true story of the Navy SEALs. That there's a lot of those Navy SEALs, when you read their books, they go and kill each other. And mm-hmm. they've realized, wow, I thought I was going after a bad guy. I found out that this is one of my teammates from 10 years ago. And he's on undercover mission. They're telling me I got to kill him because he found out too much. You know, you get tired of this stuff. And this is right. what I was just enraged in. And they literally come back if you don't fulfill your contract. And they sue you for your signing bonus. Like I had a $20,000 signing bonus for the military. They came back and took that from me when I got married. They're like, oh, yeah, we're going to come back. And you're going to have to pay us all that money back. Like, so there's this, this horrible thing. You get wounded in combat. They're going to come back, take your money back. They, they, it's a filthy, disgusting industry, and it's by design because the kingdom that they worship, like the highest ranking award that you can get in the United States Army, in the United States military, is the Congressional Medal of Honor, which has pentagrams all over it, and the mm. goddess of Ashtaroth, Liberty, the goddess, is on it. And it's like this – just this entire system of a free Masonic cult. There's a video on my channel which is called um, Land of the Free and Home of the Slaves where I talk more about it, and I show you the iconography, the symbols that they use to communicate – why this country has wholly been given over to these secret societies that really yeah. we are enacting the the wills of this this empire of evil and so many don't even know nathan oh my gosh this is just mind blowing to me um kind of going back i have a couple questions so were you essentially like a delta is that what you would call it in mind control it was like a delta program like assassin programming yes yeah, so the okay. uh, reason yeah, so the word Delta that she's talking about it comes from the – there's different names that are ascribed to different personalities and, and profile types that are that mm-hmm. are programmed into to individuals. And Delta is a letter in the Greek alphabet that is used to describe these the soldiers that are predominantly sleeper assassins, people that are, are sneaky, and they go yeah. in and do spy and espionage craft and trade craft like that. Mm-hmm. We have an entire cadre of, of a special operations group that's called the Delta Forces in the United States Army, which is yeah. uh, a, they call an elite tier, or like an upper tier of the special forces. And these are individuals who are trained to be autonomous, basically, that, that mm-hmm. you don't need a whole team of people to go with you. Like the Green Berets, which is a, another special forces the, of the United States Army, they have a team that they operate within. They can be autonomous, but predominantly they, they work within a team, whereas Delta forces are are, are trained and programmed so yeah. that they go out autonomously. They, they're they like the guys who they sent into Baghdad before everybody went into Baghdad that blew up their power stations, blew up their their water distillations, like blew up all of their means of, of taking care of their country. Mm. Right? They, you send in two guys and they can go to Home Depot and turn a city off of 700,000 people. Like this is why they really don't like these guys when they they decide no. Yeah. And they say no. This is why they yeah. suicide them. You know, they send other guys and be like, yeah, that guy's into pedophilia. We promise. You can trust us. We're the government. Go kill him. Right. And you're like, if you don't know how to test and verify what they're telling you, and you mm-hmm. don't know how to learn how to say no, you're continually trapped in that system. Which is why I don't I don't facilitate with the United States military anymore because I yeah. found that they make you swear an oath of allegiance. Is there why like why are they making all the children stand up and put their hand over their heart and swear an oath over and over and over and over again, an oath of allegiance? To another Elohim, another deity. Why do they mm. swear this allegiance? Why do they require you to swear allegiance? Yeah, literally, our master said, Yeshua said, swear not by heaven and earth, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. Like mm. I renounce every single oath and vow, and I encourage every single one of you. You want freedom from this stuff? You have to renounce those oaths. I renounce my secrecy clauses. This is why I talk about this stuff. And this is why I lost all of my benefits. I don't go to the VA. I don't get any of those. I never got my GED paid or my my 
college stuff paid for by the United States government. They don't pay for any of this stuff. When you come out against them and adversarial to them, man, they try to burn you down and put you on a blacklist. And they tried to kill me and destroy everything that I ever had in my life. But you know what? I believe that the father could build me a new house, a firm foundation so that I stop laboring in vain. Because unless a man, unless Yahuwah builds the house, we all labor in vain. And so yeah. I just wanted him to build me a house, to build me a life, to build me a future. Because the, the one that I was building and had been building my whole life was built on with, on wicked washing away sand, a quicksand. And it mm. came down with a great crash when I was, by the time I was 18 years old, I was completely distraught, disheveled, and totally despairing over my life. I had lost all of my purpose, my identity, and I was without hope in the world. And then into that, the father was looking at me like, do you want to remember what you studied? Because because my family started me with biblical foundations, yeah. I knew I could turn back to this thing. Like it says, raise up your children in the ways of Yah when they are young. And in, the, in their end, when they're older, they won't depart from it. And this is what I turned back to. I turned back to the truth. I was like, I want to know who I am. I want to know what my purpose is. Please show me who I am and what you made me for. And this is what really launched me on the path of healing and launched me on the path of deliverance to a place where I finally got to come to know that I had a purpose that was beyond death, that was yeah. for life and not death. Wow. That's powerful. And it's awesome because you talk about in one of the chapters of your book, um, I think you said deliverance in Dallas, right? And you mentioned Russ Dizdar, which I just, that book, I mean, you can't even get that book anymore, by the way, if you try to look for it. Yeah. The black awakening, it's like, it's like $2,000 on Amazon or something crazy like that. But, um, I had a question about kind of your training though, kind of going back before we jump into the healing and the deliverance part, because I think that's so important. It's so powerful. Your story. Um, but do they, did, did they test you? I mean, how did they know that you would be kind of adept in this skill of like martial arts, military type, killing someone in two, two you know, under two minutes, how, like, are these kids like yourself, are they tested in some way to like glean some insight into your gifts? How does that work? So anybody there's a, the highest paid position in a school is the school psychologist. Right. And so this is part of that finders club. Like I was telling you, that's why I'm trying to make sure you understand. It's not just one group. Right. These are people who are trained to study and analyze the mind and the people and their, their aptitudes. This is why, like when you go into schools, they start doing these tests, right? Yeah. Like why do they have standardized testing? And what are they actually looking for? If you ever participate, I went to a university of Colorado at Boulder, which is a research university. Their psychology department is one of the best in the world. It's like up there with the Stanford research psychology department and stuff research school. And when you, every freshman in, in every freshman, in this university of Colorado is required in the psychology department is required to go and do a certain amount of hours of research. Meaning other people are going to conduct research on you. You mm -hmm. go into the basements, the catacombs of that building, and you sit in these rooms and they have you look at computers and they ask you questions and they might ask you questions about the shapes of things and the triangles. And you think you're taking a test that's asking you about, you know, what are the shapes of these polygons? You know, what yeah. colors do you remember? Meanwhile, the actual experiment is a totally different set of things that's going on. It's actually testing you based off of how you interacted with this person. And did you not see mm -hmm. these different stimuluses that were in the room? They were strobing these lights at different frequencies and they're trying to see whether or not that you would eat this food and do these things. There's always a secondary set of tests and analysis that's taking place. And so a lot of the standardized testing that you have in the United States that's mandatory that they make children sit down and see whether or not they know these basic things is to find these aptitudes, is to find whether or not they're willing to do this. And this comes from personality profiling. Like uh, the, the most common one that's utilized is called the MPDD, which is like the Minnesota personality profile. It's basically to determine all kinds of psychological problems. But within that, there's hundreds of questions. Within that are lots of target questions. That means that's actually what they're looking for is to help analyze whether or not these people have these types of skills and these these capacities and just the innate desire, the wiring. Like, like there's some people who are definitely more prone to help other people, right? Mm -hmm. This is like a big subset group of people. They like to help other people. So yeah. you can play and manipulate on those people through this entire channel. Then you have other people that want to be the warriors. They want to defend people. They want to be shepherds. Mm -hmm. they, they were made to go be shepherds out in the flock. And instead we don't have a bunch of sheep to go guard. And so we're all trapped in these rooms and prison cells. And they're like, I can't do anything. And I feel worthless all the time. The first job of every teacher is to make you learn that learned helplessness, that you can have no control over the rest of your mm -hmm. life, that you have no confidence. So you have to ask me if you want to pee. If you have, mm -hmm. you have to ask me if you can ask a question, if you want to say something, you have to learn authority tells you whether or not you can or can't, right? They're, they're designed to totally manipulate children as soon as they get in that classroom. Whereas if you home, you got children that are being raised by their families, they're learning life skills that are invaluable, actually equipping them with the things that they need to know in order to be successful, competent, capable people on the face of the earth. My family would do these battery of tests because my family had access to these military handlers, right? Like right. this guy, Richard, 
they would sit down and do little tests with you and see what your aptitudes are. I mean, a good and astute observer, not just somebody who looks at stuff, somebody who pays attention and understands what it is they're looking at, is is really good at is capable of detecting talents that people have. You can find yeah. out pretty quickly whether one of your sons has really got a good balance. Does sure. he have good proprioception? Is he able to keep mm-hmm. his his hands? Where, does he know where his hands are? Is he poking himself in the eye all the time when he's trying to pick his nose? Like right. basic stuff, right? Like yeah. we love. I love. I love children, but some it's of them it. are just physiologically not so hardwired to be really dexterous. Yeah. You know, they're not capable of doing that. But then you have others that are really inclined towards it. And we have others that have an aptitude for learning, just digesting huge amounts of information and and being able to take tests very well. They're people that learn really well within that system. They get pushed into an academics program. You yeah. got others that get pushed into the musical program. You right. Know? And so my my aptitudes were just prevalent bent in that direction yeah I, I, that I makes the sense to l- learn a lot of stuff but that was one of the areas that i liked it too so it, it mm-hmm. was like a passion anything i'm passionate about i can learn and, sure. and most people are like this when they're freed from the shackles of slavery that have been put over them sure no that makes a lot of sense and so it's not just would you say it's not just these i'm i'm kind of trying to understand how the the bigger picture looks too because you see like hollywood celebrities you see the royals you see politicians etc it's not just bloodline. It's also, you know, normal people, normal people. So yeah. they're looking for anybody they can like capitalize on for their agenda. Essentially, That's why we have human resources departments in businesses. Yeah. Got we'll it. Call you human resources, y'all. Yeah, that's that's what Hello. they think of you. As. So it's not and you can find a resource from any of them. Right. This is why yeah. you get cataloged and branded right early on in your school. Mm-hmm. You get a, you get a profile. Or yeah. Like this is what you are. And it's like, yeah, but it, it, it's the beguiling of people to think that you can shove a human in a box in a profile mm-hmm. because the power of free choice is so supersedes the ability. It can destroy all those vows in a moment. Somebody can make a decision that changes the trajectory of the rest of their life and changes that that epigenetic, that curse that should have been playing out for them and their children mm-hmm. to the third and fourth generation gets broken by them. One choice, yeah. one decision. Those of you who are trapped in the system can make one decision right now. You've been exposed to this information. You're now accountable. You can now make a decision that changes the future, not just your life, but the lives of thousands of people all around you because you are willing to look this in the face and now you're willing to turn and face the forces of evil that have been building this empire against you. And you know what? You're going to get shot to pieces and it's good for you. But this is why you have this armor that comes from truth. If you're standing on truth, you will go on the greatest adventure ride of your life, y'all. If you commit yourself to speak the truth and nothing but the truth for the rest of your life and to only do what you know to be truth, you become a force of incorruptibility on the earth, and which means you are the absolute adversary to the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of liars, right? So they set themselves against you pretty ferociously in the beginning because they try to get you back in line. Mm -hmm. It's like, why do your family members, when you wake up to these things and you're studying and learning about truth, they turn around and they try to devour you. That's because they learned, they were socially engineered in schools to, hey, when one of you gets out of line, everybody get them back in line. Get them back right. in line. This is, they push us back into the, like trying to force us back into the herd. The only way they can control us is if they recruit lots and lots and lots of other people to try to be our little shepherds, which is why you, you use people like, you're like, why does somebody want to be a TSA agent? That's a great question somebody should ask. Why do you want to go be a TSA agent. Well, you got a desire generally to either make money on one side of it or you, you're willing to follow the rules very explicitly, whatever they are. You know, like, why is somebody going to become a police officer? Why is somebody going to go into those fields? Well, they're willing to follow, especially a state trooper. They're like, I am going to follow the system of dogma and I'm going to enforce it. Those are kind of the rule following people. And those are become your enforcers. You want to put those guys yeah. in positions where they're going to keep the, the cattle in line. You know, right. And so they, this is where those those finder programs can find those aptitudes and then you just create and cultivate a, a society that does that. But when you want to destroy a society like you did back in the 1970s and 80s in the inner cities, like why did they turn Harlem into what it was? Why did they turn these inner city areas into what they were? Well, they just stopped doing trash services. Mm. If, you, if you just turned off in your neighborhood today, all the trash services stopped, right? Nobody came by and picked up your trash anymore. What's that place going to turn into real quickly? Yeah. Real quickly, right? A, a literal heap of trash, right? And then if yeah. you just stop allowing the police officers, you shut down the police, defund the police stations in the area, defund the fire departments in the area, okay? And just just start to slowly pull mm. out the resources that are available. You then bring in, hu- and then you bring in a huge quantities of super cheap drugs, right? Like this is the cocaine wars and the crack epidemics. They started bringing in, this is if you guys don't know about Iran-Contra, super important information. Understand like why the, the Clinton Chronicles exist, why they were yeah. trafficking all these drugs out of Mena, Arkansas. Like this is the governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, why the Clinton family became the Clinton Foundation that we see today, engineering a society right. in its different direction. They destroyed and eradicated the lives of many, many people, and they did that so that they could completely eradicate a social structure that was strong. 
They wanted to eradicate the, the mass that any strength of a system comes first from the, the the men that are in that right position, right order in a family, a family unit that has a father, a mother, and children in a in a right order in the right. home is so powerful. You cannot mm. control it the same. So you have to destroy that. You have to get the women out of the home. You have to get the men out of the home. You have to get the children out of the home. You have to create a society where everybody just gives themselves away to the system and become slaves, which is what happened to the Israelites when they were in Egypt. It's the same spiritual Egypt that we live in. This We live in Egypt today. It's the same spirit behind them convincing us to go become slaves. They tried to work the Israelites so so hard that the men would not go be with their wives. They'd be too tired to go and be with their wives so that there would be no children. They were so given to their career that they wouldn't have any children. Like there's, it's, it's a heart wrenching reality that they've designed the same system here, but you know what, that, that spirit of Egypt, that spirit of bondage was broken when the people cried out, mm. like it says in Exodus two, that y'all heard their cries. They groaned yeah. and cried. Like I encourage people cry, scream out at the horrors of the bondages you have there where they're like, you can't come to the school unless you put this genetic experimentation program inside your children. Unless right. you give us your blood, you can't come in here. Unless you let us stab you and do a ritual to you and inject gene editing software into your child, you can't come in here. And yeah. people are like, okay, I don't have any other option. You could go be homeless yeah. tomorrow, y'all. Live in the woods. It's incredibly brutal and wonderful. And it would be so much better for you than to give your children over to serpent eaters, man. Like, have some freaking piss and vinegar in your soul and be willing to resist the works of darkness. Say no. It's the most powerful two words you can ever learn mm -hmm. in your life. No, I do. Four words. No, I do not consent. Yeah. So powerful. Absolutely yeah. breaks all of those stupid, filthy mind control that they're just constantly bombarding everyone with. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Mm, so good. Preach. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so true. I mean, that was such a mass mind control, just all of the pandemic and all of that. And, you know, I think a lot of people woke up in 2020. I think they uh, people came to this understanding, but I think now they're continuing to kind of challenge some of these things that you're talking about, you know, that we've been conditioned to believe through the school system, through our news media, right? Um, so I wanted to ask you, when you were kind of going through some of this military training, you said you were in Colorado, some of these other places, were there, was there any time where you went into like deep underground military bases, things like that? What, what did that look like if you did? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. at the United States Air Force Academy on the backside of the, they're basically, they, they call it the front range of Colorado. This is a real basic geography lesson for you. The front range of Colorado is the beginning of the Rocky Mountains. Okay. And this is where all of the cities, I think about 85% of all the population in Colorado lives on the front range, meaning in front of the mountains. People don't live in the mountains almost at all because they die there. Like it's an yeah. incredibly hostile place to live uh, over over 8,000 feet, 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet, 14,000 feet. It's a brutal place to live. So people think of Colorado, they think of the mountains, which is kind of just a good propaganda piece. Half of Colorado is just Kansas. Like mm. it literally is just Kansas, wow. just like yeah. Kansas. And so what they've done though, is because, because it sits at the heart of our country, Denver is literally what has been designed and chosen. The front range there is chosen as the capital of the new world order. And that's going to be like a big pill for some of y'all to swallow, but it's a reality. Like yeah. that is literally where they've centered the, the military industrial complex has centered itself there. The political center is they've relocated the defense intelligence agency headquarters there, the CIA headquarters there, like the space command there. They're, they've concentrated all these forms of power back, especially in the early 2000s, but, but it got really started in the 1940s and 50s during the cold war. And they started digging out bunkers, massive bunker systems like Cheyenne mountain, which was, is now publicly everyone knows as this deep underground military base. They carved yeah. out a, a Giant Granite Mountain, Cheyenne Mountain, which is right there at the at Colorado Springs. It's in the southern portion of Colorado Springs, and you can see it from the you can see it from the city. But the, what they do there is they camouflage the doors. They camouflage the entrances to look like uh, big big facades of boulders. They literally make giant boulders that look like the doors. And so in the United States Air, Air Force Academy and all there's five other military bases there: Fort Carson, Colorado, Shriver Air Force Base, Peterson Air Force Base. Predominantly, the Air Force dominates that area, but. It's literally a hub for the military complexes right there that surrounds Colorado Springs. And they've tunneled through there to create a continuity of government system. So if you want to look up the continuity of government, what you'll find out is that the United States has plans and protocols in place so that if we are ever in a major ongoing war, like with Russia or Soviet mm -hmm. Union at the time, or China or any of our other, whoever they want to play as the big bag boogeyman out there that we got to fight, oh, save us all from these bad guys. Whenever they want to stir that and foment that pop and, and, and release the dogs, the hounds of war, they they've created an entire underground system in this country, all across this country, all the way up from the 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 upper echelons of Alaska, all the way down into the Pacific Northwest, into the southern portions of the country. There's places where the governing officials for that area and the military officials for those areas are able to go underground to survive nuclear war predominantly. Yeah. 
This is what it was really built for. And so the, the, a lot of the infrastructure was built back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s when there was a huge amount of money that was being funneled into the military industrial complex so that they could keep entire cities active under, underneath our feet, factories, warehouses, supply chains, water, food, infrastructure, uh, hardware, software, like entire cities live underneath our feet. People that work there 24 seven. A lot of this got also brought in with the, with the industrial or the, the scientific community through particle accelerators, like the large Hadron Collider. People mm. talk about that over in Switzerland. There's yeah. thousands of them here in the United States, thousands of particle accelerators and atom smashers and uh, here in the United States and have been for a long time. Like the largest one that was ever being built was in Texas and like 28 miles, just massive facilities built in Texas. And they're all over the place. And it, people just this is kind of stuff that just well the propaganda that everyone points at is the big scary stuff over in Switzerland. Look out for that yeah. stuff in Geneva. Oh yeah, that's y'all. There are so many here in the United States, in from Manhattan to Chicago and Stanford research laboratories. They've been using this stuff in in Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge, uh, Tennessee, like where they did the Manhattan Project. They've been using this kind of military scientific community to build other underground cities so that we could have the scientific power and the military power to fight this war with the the gods that are going to contend against us. If that's the Soviets or it's the, you know, the invaders that they're trying to get everybody hopped up on right now. And they're like, oh, yeah, look out for the aliens. They're going to come and get us. You nice. know, like they always got their little bad boogeyman's and their PR campaigns to try to foment everyone for the, the dog's war. But the, the truth is that the United States Air Force Academy, there is a massive underground tunnel network in order to survive nuclear war with the Soviets. And so I got brought into one of those bunkers in particular on the backside of Rampart Range Road is literally just a big giant boulder and you can pull it open with one hand and it swivels open and there's just tunnels. It looks like a normal build building. If you've ever been into a United States military building, the majority of the infrastructure was built in the 50s. So it's just like white linoleum floors and white paint everywhere. Yeah. And so yeah. if you're inside these buildings, you don't even know. Oftentimes, if you, you go into work at a regular portion of on the surface of a building and you go into your office building further down or you drive, get in a vehicle and you get transported in, you don't know that you're underground more often than not because really? it's just a continuity of the system. And so yeah. you might be driving back and forth between different buildings underground, but it's not, it doesn't appear to be that way. It doesn't feel like a cave. It just feels like you're in buildings all the time. So it kind of, I think in people's heads, they think it always looks like these be big caverns and big caves with stalactites yeah. and, and yeah. falling over the walls. And it's like, no, it just looks like buildings. They build big concrete block buildings inside inside of these these underground structures like the entire complex in Cheyenne Mountain sits on top of springs gigantic springs the whole entire complex sits on top of springs so that if it could survive a direct hit with a nuclear weapon the entire building even though the rocks are crumbling and shaking and falling down around it the building itself would be able to stabilize during that because they house so much hardware for their mm -hmm. communication systems for the North American Space Defense Commands anything that goes into the air they track it there so it's really sensitive electronics there they don't want that stuff getting shaken apart so Wow. That's out there in Cheyenne Mountain. And I, I was part of programs that were there at the Air Force Academy and then one briefly at Fort Carson, Colorado, that connected to an area called Black Forest, which is north of Colorado Springs outside of a town called Monument. And there was an entire tunnel system that you could go from Shriver Air Force Base to Peterson and you could go to the Air Force Academy and you can drive the entire distances on without ever having to go to the surface. And that was so that they could survive these these battles and these wars that they thought sure. they were going to be fighting. Sure. Wow. Fascinating. I know because you think about the Denver airport and, you know, you see all that like Illuminati stuff there and then you think, what's going on in Colorado, you know? So I think- Number two, sex trafficking capital of the United States. That's what's going wow. on in Colorado. Wow. It's Denver, Colorado. Like you go to Atlanta, Georgia, number one, all the time, forever. Really? Anywhere that has intersecting interstates, anywhere that has intersecting interstates and an international airport is a hotbed of human trafficking. Yeah. And so Atlanta, Georgia is the number one for that because it goes international big time out on the Atlantic coast, but Denver's the number- one on this side of the Mississippi and has been for a long time. And it is, is a house of, of evil because if this, yeah. they have to feed these beasts, they yeah. literally have to feed this kingdom. And this is the way they do that. Wow. Unbelievable, but yet believable, <laughs> you know? Um, so, okay. So talk us through just kind of your, your moment. Cause I know you were, you were at home, right. And you were going to kill yourself. Essentially you were trying to, and you had this moment where, you know, your life changed. Talk us through that and kind of what that looked like in the, and your deliverance aspect too. So when I was, uh, after I basically had that, uh, no-go order with the United States military, I left my advanced training in Fort Lee, Virginia, and they started putting me on a, uh, 
uh, reprogramming protocols. So they, they, they diagnosed me with these minor and multiple traumatic brain injuries, MTBIs, yeah. minor traumatic brain injuries, and then traumatic brain injuries. People kept bashing my head in trying to kill me. And I, and I started coming unglued. Let's just put it super nicely. Right. I really began to come undone. And so they started putting me on these pharmaceuticals and taking me to these neuro linguistic reprogramming centers at the Air Force Academy. Like, even though I was in the United States Army, they had my treatment protocols, when I shipped back to Fort Carson and went back to my duty station there at Fort Carson, all of my treatment was at Fort, was at the Air Force Academy. And that's because that's where I'd done it previously when I was younger, when I was 12, 13, and 14 years old. That's where I'd done a lot of it. And so they sent me back there to try to get me back online. And the mm. way they do that, y'all, is, is the way they like – when they want to get rid of somebody in the United States military after they're like used up, they put them on a lot of pharmaceuticals, mind-altering drugs in order to get them to kill themselves. So this is why like – why Prozac is the number one link we find with people that commit homicidal or suicidal acts. Prozac. It's just super concentrated amounts of hydrofluorosilicic acid, fluoride, like what they dump in a bunch of people's drinking water. The municipalities mm. in the United States dump in our drinking water, try to keep us dumbed down and dulled. Well, when certain people take that stuff, it makes it very homicidal and suicidal, especially when they're under distress, right? They're mm -hmm. having a hard, hard day, hard life situations. A lot of them go and kill themselves or they hurt others. And so they start pumping, they started pumping a lot of those drugs into me, like ProVigil was, or, um, Pro propanol, which is like they use for seizure medications, stuff like that, yeah. and uh, Ambien and and uh, these these like other these drugs that really made me completely come disconnected from reality. Like whereas the old religion people they used like satanic rituals, right? They do these like trauma and these abuse stuff. Yeah. The modern version of it is just a lot of drugs, predominantly drugs, which is what like you were talking about earlier with Operation Paperclip and some of the the scientists that were brought over. To answer when I got on all those drugs and went to that program, they sent me to another place, uh, another a gal named Colonel Terrio at Fort Carson, Colorado, and she ran a traumatic brain injury specialist team. And what they did is they put those soldiers, anybody who had these issues, they put them on a huge quantity of drugs. I had 11 uh, pharmaceuticals that they put me on. They put me on those, did a whole bunch of stuff with fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and reprogramming. So while you're in an fMRI machine, the thing that scans your brain and watches actively fluid changes in your brain, they start flashing lights and doing all these different things to try to get you back into a cycle. And they started patterning in me that I needed to shoot and stab myself. I need to shoot and stab myself, shoot and stab yourself. You'll become a hero if you shoot and stab yourself. And so literally that's what I did. Thanksgiving morning, like my, my entire family went to Lake Havasu city to go be with my grandfather and do their little filthy stuff down there with him. I stayed back because I lied to them and told them I had military drill. And when I stayed back, I, I threw a huge party at my parents' house. And then the next morning I cleaned the house up and shot and stabbed myself multiple times. And, uh, literally began to bleed out to death on the back of my patio, uh, my parents' basement. And I, while standing there, it was like the entire time before that, I'd kind of been in this autonomous watch dissociative state, watching myself yeah. do all this stuff. And this is for, for soldiers specifically in Delta is what's programmed into a Delta first is what's called your Omega protocol, which is where it's the end. And this is where mm. you kill yourself. This is why you see a lot of these guys who go on these shooting rampages, and they kill themselves. You're like, yeah, they always kill themselves at the end of that. That's called Omega programming. And that's, that's there to protect the secrets of, of everybody who else is involved. Right. Because every time right. you look at one of those things, man, there's a whole entire group of people that was a part of that, that they're like, as long as we can at least foment everyone and be like, oh, this horrible thing's happening. Oh yeah. But the guy's dead. So it's okay. Go back to sleep. Right. You know? They, they like to wrap up everything with that. And so that's that's what happened to me. And uh, and there were 17 different guys that were in that program at the same time as I was. And 11 of them killed themselves that week. That same week killed themselves. Now, mm -hmm. I shot and stabbed myself multiple times. And I literally believe the only reason I'm alive is because the father intervened drastically to save my life. And I was standing there bleeding to death on the outside of my parents' basement. And I was looking out at this place. Uh, it... It's called Santa's Workshop. It's a real creep fest over there. It's like the highest Ferris wheel in the world, and it's at eight thousand feet at the base of Pikes Peak. And I was standing out there, staring out at this thing, and 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 watching everything come out, like feeling my blood gush out of my body onto my feet. It was so cold on my feet, and oh. I, I felt I felt death in a totally different way. Like I have had so much horrible things happen to me. I have, I've had, I've nearly died so many times and had so much blood come out of my body, but I've never had that much come out of me. And I, I felt there, my, a, a cold come into me that was inescapable. Like, like, like it's like, it's, it's a finality. Like you could yeah. never warm up again. And, wow. and I felt this fiery hot blood landing all over my feet. And I'm looking out over this, this valley and seeing death come for me. Like yeah. I had, I had been in this covenant with death from the days of my youth. Like the first time I ever killed a man. So now six years old and they did this filthy mm -hmm. ritual with this guy that they kind of dressed up like Jesus and tortured, tortured people. And then they gave us the opportunity to kill him, just kill that guy. And like, I got possessed by death when I did. 
so confused, thinking it's not real, not knowing what's happening, and finally thinking I'm getting vengeance and killing this guy. And I got possessed with death and I got into this covenant with yeah. this kingdom that I could not get away from. Like I, I couldn't get out. People are like, how does it still happen? Like, how, why didn't you say anything? You like, cause they kill people. They torture them. They, they, they're like, um, you see what we're doing to her right now? You see what we're doing to her? We're going to do that to your sister. Wow. And they are going to do that to your sister. If you talk about these things mm. and you're, you're just like, you're, your power, they, they make you think you're powerless to stop it. Yeah. They convince you so brilliantly that you could never escape. Mm. And so when I finally saw death come, this prince of darkness, come to harvest me, come to have me for eternity, I knew it was over. I knew I was on. And I just sat there ready. And, and the man just came and a man appeared to my left and his right. And he stood in between him and me. He just stood between him and me. And he said, he is mine. You cannot have him. And I saw fear come over death's face. I saw his face be, be filled with fear. And he turned and left. He turned and left. I never saw the face of this man, but I knew that was the word of Elohim, the word of God. I knew that was the son of righteousness. I knew that was the truth embodied on this earth. I knew that was my redeemer. I knew his voice. He says, my sheep, John 10, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. He says, there's one way in and one way out of the kingdom and your relationship back to the father. He built a bridge. That's what a priest does. They're bridge builders. He built a bridge over the impossible chasm that we could never cross from our sin and our transgression, our failure to follow the right instructions. We yeah. were born in this iniquity system, this beastly system, and we could never go back unless there was someone who came and built the bridge back. And that's what he did. And he stands there as the sole shepherd, the chief shepherd who lets people in and come across to enter into their rest. He says, you come into my sheepfold. That's a big giant place to protect his flock. He says, yeah. you can come into my sheepfold and you can go out and have pasture. You can go out to peace. And that's what he gave to me. He gave me an opportunity to have life again. And he, in that moment, I knew I was not destined for death, that I was destined for life. And if at any moment it was over, it should have been then. But yeah. he intervened for me. And he, as clear as day, told me, you need to stop the bleeding and call 911. And so that's literally what I did. I Because at that point, I literally was just standing there watching all this blood come out of me. And in this total just dissociative omega state. And all of a sudden, it was like he gave me my mind back. Like it says to Nebuchadnezzar, for seven years, he walked around like a lycanthropy, like a werewolf. He was cursed by the watcher because he had risen himself up in pride and he went and ate grass like an ox and his feathers grew out of his body and hair and na nails grew out. He turned into a beast for seven years. And then it said he finally came to his senses and he was given his he was, his mind was restored to him. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. I finally was like all of the pharmaceuticals. I don't care how many drugs they can shove in your system, how drunk you are, how high you are. The word of Elohim can come to you in a moment and cut through all of that and give you a soundness of mind instantly. And that's what he did for me. And so when I ran inside and I grabbed towels and I put them on my abdomen to stop the hemorrhaging that was going on, I couldn't really address. I shoved my fingers inside my the hole inside my thigh, in my pinky inside and my thumb inside the other side to try to cut off the bleeding that was going on there. And I called 911 and I sat there in this chair, this little desk chair where I did homeschool and all this other stuff, sat there bleeding out and trying to get these people to come and help me, come and help me and just begging them to come and help me. And instead they had an ambulance that got there. I believe within 14 minutes, the ambulance showed up at my door and yet they sat there for 45 minutes waiting for me to die because that's what they were ordered to do. They waited for me to die. They waited till I lost consciousness. They literally thought I lost consciousness and died. And then they came in and cleared the scene. They cleared the scene and then they brought in the paramedics to get me out of there. But they did everything in their power carnally to let me die. But you know what? Yahweh did not appoint me to death. And you can't kill someone that is so full of convictions and has the anointing of Yah. That's the reason I'm alive. There, there's no physical thing that I have done to keep myself alive at this point in my life. He is the only reason I'm alive. He is the reason my children are alive and my wife and I are alive and continue to be so as, as long as he says so. Otherwise, we are absolutely immortal. And that's the same for any of you who choose to walk in his kingdom. Them, you are absolutely immortal unless he says otherwise. Yeah. And I got to experience that. And so I, I knew after that moment, they, they ended up, they, they set up all these camera crews down there during this whole time while I was waiting. They set up all these camera crews down there at the intersection in Cascade, Colorado, waiting to film this whole thing because they had a PR campaign ready to go. And they, they filmed me getting loaded into a flight for life helicopter and flying off and taking off. And this was the big news on Thanksgiving morning back in, in Colorado Springs. It was the, you know, the headline news for that day and a couple days out there in the Gazette down there. 
And this was literally my introduction to the public world, this psycho who shot and stabbed himself, but lied and said other people did it to him. And, and so they use this as like my defamation campaign so that later on in life, yeah. they're like, oh yeah, this guy's a liar. He's psycho. He's crazy, bipolar and all this other stuff. Don't listen to anything he says. Right. And so even, even so then like 10 years later, I got into this, like, let me just pause for a second. Sure. Y'all helped me get healing physically from that wound, but I lost emotionally my identity and my friendships and people, people made me a pariah. I was banned from my, my friends groups, schools I went to, I was, I was turned into a, a plague on the earth. And that is, that is something that the enemy can do to you. That is painful yeah. beyond measure and humiliating. But you know, what it went into the fires there for me was my pride and it was good mm -hmm. for me. And it's good for us to lose our pride and know that, you know what, because people have a bad day, never judge somebody on their worst day. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Judge them on the fruits of their life. That's what we're commanded to inspect in people. Look at their fruits yeah. over the long term. That's how you know who's a wolf and who's a sheep. That's how you just dismember the Fabian socialist society. Is you just watch them by their fruits and you follow yep. the people that have the fruits of righteousness and you flee from those that don't. Yep. You know, but that's that was really where a lot of this started. They tried to put me on a whole bunch more drugs and 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 medication. There's a, a center there in Boulder, Colorado at the University of Colorado called the Sutherland Institute, which is for families of these really rich and elite people to shove their children in to get reprogrammed and brought back in and keep them in line. And they have a bunch of handlers there that, that work yeah. at the Southern, Sutherland Institute. And that's where they would keep tabs on me and try to keep me on drugs. But I would I stopped taking all the pharmaceuticals and it was like my mind came back to me. Mm. And I finally was like free to think. Like I was finally free to think. My hair stopped falling out. I stopped having tachycardia. I wake up with my chest bruised. Like they were trying to kill me for so long. But I finally stopped all of that. And I was like, I'm going to believe the scripture is true and that you can heal me and nothing else can. And that was when he started to really rebuild my identity, really restore mm. me. And this is where ultimately about 10 months later, I ended up meeting the gal who had become my wife, Chelsea, who brought to me an embodiment of love and of, and of compassion and, and care that I needed in order to actually get to a place where I was safe enough to process lifetimes of trauma. Wow. Wow. That is amazing. I mean, just that was so powerful. I mean, you guys can't see me, but my eyes are like tearing up. And I mean, just hearing how God delivered you um, and how he just came in that moment. And you said you, you noticed there was a man there, but you didn't see his face, but you felt the presence of who he was. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So then did your family, I mean, do you have any contact with your family anymore or is that just completely shut off? So it was, uh, I still had contact with my family up until that point in my life. Yeah. My dad was still somebody that I was like close friends with. Now <clears throat> I, I want to be clear because sometimes when I, I reference my family, people all, um, awesome, often assume I'm talking about just like my mom and dad and, and my sisters, but I'm talking about yeah. the, the people that, that were chronically my abusers and perpetrators and stuff like that were, were my grandfather and my great grandfather. Those okay. were the majority of the people that were really my family that were part of this system in a very yeah. serious way. Now, my father, my father abdicated his responsibility and allowed his son to get passed into this stuff and, yeah. and turned a blind eye to it and, and handled us in totally different ways, but not not like primary abuser style. Yeah. That makes sense. Because yeah, that sure does that's clear because sometimes that gets Thank lost you. in the mix. And um, so I but on the surface, I still had these relationships with with my biological family members or my family members for what it's worth. And um, and I, I ended up getting married to Chelsea and as far as she knew me, I was a much more happy and pleasant and, and upbeat and happy Christian kind of guy and psychology yeah. and all this stuff. And then halfway into our marriage, my dad moved into our house with us because he said, you know, I, our, they've fallen on bad times and stuff like that. And he needed help looking for a house and he was going to be working at this job or a critical infrastructure person. My dad's a controller of of massive amounts of the uh, natural gas industry mm -hmm. in uh, in North America. And one of the one of a few people who controls huge quantities of natural gas and where it flows to to create electricity for the United States. This is where yeah. they put a lot of mind control people. Anyways, mm -hmm. he had a job there in in Colorado um, in an area called Golden that he needed to be at. And so he's like, oh, just let me stay there in your extra room in your basement. But when he did that, he started working with my mind again to try to get me back into these projects and and to turn me back in to be a profiteering agent for the family. Yeah, and That's when this whole major catastrophic switch happened between me, as I used to present myself, Nate, as this much more happy and everybody that used to know me used to know me as this other kind of guy who who never showed anger, never showed frustration, mm -hmm. never, never showed violence of any kind to Nathan, which was literally a, a very contrary person to that. Shaved my head, began wearing body armor and, and strapping knives to my chest all the time, carrying multiple pistols on myself and, and becoming fully engrossed in the world of, of self-defense and, yeah. and hunting humans. And I started infiltrating networks in Boulder, Colorado and trying to eliminate pedophile rings that were going on there. It's like, I'm hardwired in a sense, in a good way 
to dismantle these empires. And so I started just going out between 11 o'clock and four o'clock in the morning at Boulder, Colorado, and just making lists and identifying people and documenting stuff that was going on and trying to preach the gospel to the people that were there that needed help and needed prayer and needed counsel because a lot of the Christians left at 11 p.m. All the Christians left. If you ask a homeless person where the righteous people are, they always know where they are. And they can tell you where they are. And they tell you that the Christians leave at 11 o'clock. And I was like, dang, right? They do because they're cowards. They've been, they've been made to be cowards. I'm not trying to be derogatory towards you. But if you don't actually know your identity from the beginning to the end, you get lost yeah. in the kingdom of cowardice. And unfortunately, that's what we have in the sissified pastors that stand on the stage and mm. tell you a bunch of psychological pep talk and don't preach from this book like it actually matters, like their lives depend on it, like they're going to die if they don't listen to these words. Th there was a zealousness that I had, but at the same time, my wife was a stranger to me. I didn't want anything really to do with her because to me, she was like a big, heavy anchor that was weighing me down and not allowing me to just go kill everybody and then disappear into the ether like I'd been my whole life. And right. so it created this horrible mutual animosity, it went from a really... Uh, I mean, a marriage that we loved each other to a marriage that where we just basically were strangers passing in the night. And a lot of that began to break down. However, in the same time, I began to study and explain to her a lot of this stuff that had happened, not yeah. the mechanics of what happened to me, but how this kingdom of darkness operates, how Satan infiltrates the church, how we started going and hearing Russ Dizdar, like you mentioned again, we started going to these conferences where Russ Dizdar was speaking, a guy who had that book, Black Awakening, which was the rise of the satanic super soldier. And he has a, at, on his website, you can listen to him, give a whole entire dissertation about the entire book, chapter by chapter. It's called the blackawakening.com. And he has a playlist there, lots of playlists. Russ has more audio content than I can even start to get you guys around. If you go to shatterthedarkness.net, shatterthedarkness.net, he has thousands of hours of audio training courses that he's done, like Satanism 101. Excellent. Yeah. This is the start of freedom Encounters. He's got Thank so you. much information there to share with y'all. But blackawakening.com is where you can still have access to the book that they're trying to hide from everyone. Y'all willing, I can get a copy of it. If any of you have a copy of it, we can scan it in a PDF and then can do an audio of it and make sure that it gets shared to everyone. I love so it. Let me know. Send me an email at snatch from the flames at protonmail.com and we will get that going. But nice. it was at that time in my life where I still had some contact with my family, but a lot less common. And I really began to expose to my wife the innermost portion of who I was. I began to reveal to her a lot of the horrible things that happened to me. And she didn't turn away from me. She didn't she didn't abandon me. And she had this this deep love for me. And she harbored me from the storms of chaos that had been raging for so long in my life. And she created for me a shelter of love even though she didn't necessarily understand everything, even though she didn't, she couldn't relate. Like yeah. the truth is y'all, as much as you guys want to, to understand what happens to people that go through this stuff, there's not a day in your life you can ever understand it. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much you want to, how many videos you watch about it, how much you hear about it. You can't know for a single second what it feels like to be utterly powerless to people that are stealing your innocence day and night and day and night to learn what it feels like to have somebody physically take from you everything that you ever held as something that was dear until you experience it you cannot comprehend it like parents who watch their children slowly suffer and die from diseases for months or years they start to get an understanding of just how much anguish a human being can endure how much mm. suffering can somebody contain within their body within their soul and keep on going and you know what my wife be and began to understand that and it 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 made her a totally different woman. It made her willing to wade into a muck and a filth that was so disgusting, so horrible that it was going to contaminate her. There was no way about it. Like when I shared this with her, she was going to become filthy with me. She mm -hmm. climbed down into that disgusting, abominable place with me in my soul. And she held on to me while I wrenched my soul out of it. While I up nightmares that had happened to me while well, I vomited out the violence, the rage and the evil. And I showed her who I was yeah. and she stuck with me and she let her white robe, the, the her white wedding dress get so filthy. And you know what? Mm -hmm. She stayed with me and she waded into it and began to help me clean up this horrible filth and wash me with the water of the word. She restored to me. She helped to restore to me my purpose because mm. she didn't leave me. It didn't, yeah. it didn't mean she was like, my wife's not necessarily like a master counselor or anything like that. But if you have a husband or a wife, they should be your counselor. You mm. should be the most trusted associate on the earth should be your spouse. You shouldn't have to pay a counselor to get help. You should be able to have that relationship with your spouse so that you can have that. That's why we have each other because you know what? Marriage is crazy. It's crazy. It's awesome. And it's insane all at the same time. It's great. And it's horrible. It's beautiful. And it's violent. Oh, it's great stuff. 
because it tears apart that former person that you used to be because you used to be one man or one woman and now you're not you're not your own and you you choose to become one with each other that means how i choose to use my body is how i choose to use hers how she chooses to use her body is how she chooses to use mine like we become interconnected which means mm. all of that bondage from my past as long as it didn't get cleansed was going to be on her mm. and i wanted her to be free from it i wanted our children naomi who she was pregnant with at the time when i told her all this stuff i wanted her to be free from this i didn't want naomi to know this world I didn't yeah. want this to be her. I didn't want her to wake up with blood coming all out of her body from people violating her. You know what I mean? I yeah. didn't want my daughter to suffer the touch of molesters. Like it should be that way for parents. Like that should right. be a basic thing. However, disgustingly so, I find everywhere I go in ministries and communities all over this country, parents and people who cover up molestation and sex crimes mm -hmm. everywhere, they let their children get devoured all over the place everywhere i've go without fail i find their filthy disgusting matters i can smell it i was like my whole life i've known the stink of sickness and mm -hmm. i can find it in these people everywhere i go i can smell the sodom sodom burning with sulfur that's literally that's why i have this chunk of sulfur my whole life i've carried this little chunk of sulfur around i got this in uh, silverton colorado when i was like seven years old and I know the stench of sulfur because you mm. know what? When you light this on fire, it burns as blue as this shirt I'm wearing. And there is wow. nothing so indistinguishable about the smell of sulfur when it burns. And this is what I smell with this filth everywhere. And I know the beauty of it. Yahuwah says he's going to rain down sulfur on these people. And it purifies. When you light this stuff on fire and throw it on top of parasites, they burn to ash. Mm. No parasite survives that stuff. That's why he uses it. You know, he wow. destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and these five cities of the plains with sulfur and burning chunks of sulfur. This is why you can drive into Kansas and the whole area of eastern Colorado, they call it the chalk beds, is full of burning chunks of sulfur, like literally fire and brimstone rained out of the sky all over Kansas and that whole region and buried it. You can walk around and it smells like this because wow. he rains this down on areas to eradicate diseases, horrible parasitic diseases, that iniquity force that turns people into monsters, makes them like vampires. They call yeah. them the Grigori. Right. This is these watchers that came down again at Sodom and Gomorrah and started trying to mingle and, and augment DNA and raise them up. That's why all the men in Sodom and Gomorrah were trying to beat down the door to have sex with the angels. They wanted to get their seed. And they're like, right. well, the angels kind of figured out, hey, if I just if I let somebody rape me and they start to mingle themselves, well, I didn't do it. So I'm not as guilty as Azazel and Gadriel and Simyaza and these other ones who did it. But this judgment is certainly still pertinent and true. I keep these as reminders, these living stones as testimonies to remember that Yahuwah is going to rain down a judgment that's so unstoppable that every one of the wicked truly will perish and it will root out all the evil that's taking place in there. And I choose now to confess my sins and share all of this stuff now so that I can have total freedom from it. I want freedom from it. I want my children to be free from it. I confess my sins so that I can be healed. And any of you who have any sins of your past like this, the way out, the way across that that bridge is confession of your sins. And I know that's so churchy entity feeling. And you might be shutting down because you think I'm talking about preaching to you. You got to understand this is why this is the literal cure to the cancer that's corrupting your soul. The one that makes you so miserable and feel like you have no purpose and no identity and why you you're so discontent. The cure for that discontentment is confession. You don't got to tell me. You don't got to go and preach, scream it out to everybody on the face of the earth. But I tell you this, you have the duty to confess these things that are killing you mm -hmm. to get them out of you. When you get them out of you, everything that's hidden, that's been bound up in there, all that filth that's poisoning you, that black tar will come out of you. And you know what? You can get washed. You come in and you wash yourself with the water of the word. Like read it from beginning to end. Just I challenge you one time. That's why I did an entire audio recording of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and gave that to people so that they could hear the word being preached. Because they need to know that if this, they can't have any faith unless they hear the word. It says hearing, belief comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of Elohim. And like, if you wash yourself in that, it's literally like somebody coming in and just cleansing the entire space, every filthy corner of that place so that you can have a clean area. Like this is a nice clean room. But yeah. Diligence. It requires that way. If you leave this, oh my gosh, we're out in the Ozark cell. If you leave a house out here sitting. For less than a year, in a year or less, it will be covered in vines. It will be it will be taken over by mold so fast. This entire place will become uninhabitable within a year or 18 months, maybe two years. The entire place will be condemned. Like 
this 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 creation is groaning. It's like a garment that's wearing out, man. And everything is designed to totally def- just swallow it and turn it back into the force that it was. And yeah. this is what will happen if you leave that stuff in you. It's going to consume you. It's going to mm-hmm. corrupt you. And it's going to poison everyone around you. But if you confess with your lips and and you get free from this stuff and you believe that that these words to be true, you don't have to say some sinner's prayer and all that other nonsense. You don't have to do that stuff, y'all. You start walking in faith, walking in belief. You know what? Even though I can't understand everything necessarily, I'm just going to go ahead and read my way through this book before I ever say I believe it. Like, don't yeah. ever tell don't ever tell somebody that you believe this book if you've not read it. That's such nonsense. That's such ridiculous. It's such an excuse for your failure to take a discipline in your life and make a discipline like every day reading through this thing. Don't say you believe it until you know what it says because that's just so foolish. You don't even know what it says and you also don't know what's required of you unless you know this, unless you read it. He tells you explicitly, this is what's required of you, a man. Literally, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. People are like, oh, he's the wisest man. Yeah, except he came into sacrificing his own children and butchering his own babies and, and in every form of evil and enchanted wizardry, he got into it. He's the one who created so much the mystery religions that we see today. Mm. People like Aleister Crowley, they're all reading these other books that Solomon wrote that corrupted people. But you know what? At the end of his life, he turned and he confessed his sins. That's why the book of Ecclesiastes and Ecclesiasticus, why these books exist that are so powerful, the wisdom of Solomon, because he shows you, hey, this is the whole matter of life. Fear Yahuwah and walk in his ways. Like, revere him. Do, like, fear him. Understand that he is the only one you're supposed to fear. 365 times in the scriptures, you're told, do not fear. Altira. But then he tells you there's only one you should ever fear. And it's him because yeah. he's a good father. You should fear a good shepherd. Like you should you should understand a shepherd is a super dangerous dude. A shepherd is a super dangerous dude. If you're a wolf, he will kill you so relentlessly. Yeah. <laughs> he will hunt you down and snatch the lamb out of your mouth and break your jaw and crush your teeth and skin you alive and wear your skin suit to make sure every other wolf knows I'm coming for you. Mm. That's what he did. That's what he he did. He is there to help you understand that he loves you. He cares for you. He will fight for you. He will be your defense. He will be your shield and your exceedingly great reward. He is a good father. And if you have no concept of what that is, because I clearly did not have a right concept of what that is, I look at this and I understand there's a good father and he cares for me and he will care for you and look after you. If you cur- turn, repent, turn from the ways of your other life and follow him follow his ways. He will make you the man and the woman you were made to be. That is so much better than anything you could have hoped and imagined. Mm. So good. I mean, I always like to, to kind of end the podcast with hope. And I think that's exactly what you did. And you've come a long way. It's been a, it's been quite a journey for you. And I just, I really appreciate you, Nathan, just coming here and meeting with me and just sharing your story so transparently. Um, I just, I just pray that the people listening will just have a heart change. You know, if there's areas in their life that they need to turn over to the Lord, they need to repent, like you said, to do it because you have this. I mean, if you can do this as a man that has been through all of this and now your life is something completely different, that's, that's hope right there. Wouldn't you say? Always hope. Yeah. Always always hope. hope. Yes, there is. There's always hope, y'all. And I just, last thing I want to say to y'all, no matter if you're the perpetrator of this or you're the victim of this and you're both, this, there is so much freedom that is that you, you cannot even know because if you've lived your life in slavery, you've never tasted choice. You've never even known how sweet of a savor it can be when you have a day that's yours. When you have your own time back, when you have your mind back, when you when you get your body back, it it is so rewarding. It's better than any amount of power that you have could ever offer you. There is an illusion that has been placed over so many of us that if I just had that, I would be satisfied. But you know mm-hmm. what? The true greatest gift that we could ever be given in all of life is contentment in all circumstances. And that is what I want for you all to experience, that you can be content in your circumstances, no matter what they are. But that contentment comes from a firm foundation in knowing who you are, what you were made to do, that you have a purpose, you have a destiny, you have a you have a mission to mm-hmm. fight against this evil, to wage a war with wickedness. And you know what? It all starts, though, by you looking at down the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, and contending eagerly, fighting ferociously, for the sake of the truth. And by doing so, you will live a a beautiful life, a life that is worth remembering. 
a life that is worth being remembered and valued. Because you know what? At the end of your life, you get to this phase they call it the legacy phase, where you want to look back and understand. Like you'll see this with older people that want to have a conversation with with the younger generation of like what they did. If you take the time, if you revere, like it says in the scriptures, you're supposed to stand up when a, when a person with a gray hair walks in the room. It says rise up when the gray headed walk in the room. You're supposed to stand up and respect them because they've they've gone a lot further, y'all. And you know what? They're in a phase of life where they're looking. They can't physically work with their body in the same way, but their mind is there and they want to impart the wisdom of what they've learned. And I encourage you all, just remember, there is so much pure truth that will come to you if you are willing to forsake the pride the, the the vanity and the things that have built you up for so long in your life and you can cling to a way of righteousness. It is so rewarding. I get to lay down and sleep in peace. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was more that was more valuable than anything I had ever been promised in that kingdom. I laid down in peace because I knew my hands weren't tainted by blood. I right. knew that I hadn't corrupted anybody. I knew I hadn't coerced anybody. Like I knew I could lay in peace because I had lived an authentic day. And you know what? I want that for each and every one of you. I want you to be able to rest and ha- not have the enemy stealing your sleep anymore. I want you to, your family and your marriage, your relationships, your children to know life and a life that's more abundant than anything you could hope and imagine. And it comes through living authentically according to the ways that he told us to do it. Amen. That's I appreciate that. That is so well said. And I want the same for you guys. And I just, gosh, Nathan, thank you so much for coming on. It really really means a lot to me. So I hope you guys enjoyed and um, we will see you next time. Bye.